Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Wu Yu event with Dr. Selena McGee. Her presentation is on Show Your Lids and Lashes Some Love. I am your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So I'm excited to introduce our speaker tonight, though she is probably not a stranger to any of you that are on here, which is probably why we have such an awesome attendance tonight. Dr. Selena McGee is the visionary founder and the owner of Bespoke Vision, which is a boutique private practice that offers patients a wide range of optometric care via its dry eye center, specialty contact lens center, and aesthetics suite. Uh, she was definitely one of the, the drivers in helping expand the scope of practice in Oklahoma, and she's one of the first ODs in the, or is the first OD in the country to perform neurotoxin injections and laser resurfacing. So she has a lot of awesome practical tips to share with us today that we can take into clinic tomorrow. So we're super excited to hear from her. And here are some of her financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated. All right, we'll let you take it away from here. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Dr. Serenzi. Welcome, everybody. And we are going to have some fun tonight and show our lids and lashes some love. And we know that our patients don't always do that, right? And they do things that they unknowingly sabotage. Sometimes they're our best efforts and do things to themselves that they don't know what the end consequences can be. And sometimes those those conversations can be a little bit awkward. So we're going to talk about all of those and I'll give you some good resources. And then towards the end of the lecture, we'll kind of make things more simple. And because this can be really overwhelming. Um, so why are we really here? So I'm going to show this video because this is super important, right? We see patients doing things to themselves that they have no idea that when they're putting on that eyeliner on the inside of their eyelid that they're covering up, you know, every meibomian gland orifice possible. And then looking at all of the glitter that's on the inside of that lid. And then we've got lash extensions or false eyelashes. There's multiple things that our patients are doing that we have to have conversations around. And so I'm going to walk you through just how I think about things, how I see things. And then we'll talk more about how to make those conversations really simple and unintimidating so that this is not what you're doing. And for my, my male ODs on the call, we're going to take this like down to the bare bones also. So this is not what you're doing in clinic and we'll give you some great pearls on how to talk about this and what we're doing. Let's talk first just about cosmetics in general and how the FDA looks at this, because this is pretty widely unregulated. The FDA hasn't touched this definition of cosmetic or looked at this since the year 1938. And that's important because when patients hear that, and I often will tell them that, listen, this whole industry is very unregulated. And when we talk about things that are happening to the surface, because they don't understand that what they're buying is marketing. And a lot of times they're confused because there's all of this lingo too in the space. Oh, it's clean or it's natural. It's hypoallergenic. It's fragrance free. What does all of that really mean? And as it turns out, it, it doesn't really mean anything, which further complicates this conversation so I want to give you some pearls on just how to simplify it. And I was privileged enough to be part of the latest uh, tier film ocular society, TFOS. They did a lifestyle workshop and one of the subcommittees was on cosmetics. So this has been, uh, it's in the, the space now. So this was published back in May. So just about eight weeks ago. And we now have this resource that, tells us some of this information and we still need more research, but this goes a long way towards helping us have this conversation with our patients and also gives us some information in the space that's been published that we can also share with patients because it's not just the cosmetic, it's the habits too, just like what we saw on that video where the physical part of what people are doing can be harmful to the front surface. And then we're going to talk about just best practices. How do we take the best care of our eyelids and eyelashes? You know, the dental industry has done such a great job of 
teaching the public why it's important to go in every six months and have their teeth cleaned and how to best take care of our teeth and our gums so that we have our teeth for life. And, you know, we can actually make new teeth. I mean, you can have a post, but this is the only set of eyes that we get. And our patients feel that I have patients every day say that, you know, I want to know the best practices because this is the only set of eyes that I get. And they don't want to do things that are harmful. And many times they're doing it unknowingly. So this is a really simplified version of, okay, yes, this is mascara, but there's all kinds of bad things that go inside this. And remember that this is a mascara tube that goes into a dark container where whatever you're putting on and it lives on your eyelashes is also going back into that dark tube where it might live for three months, six months, nine months, depending on how often you throw your mascara away. So things that are simple to talk about are just good hygiene practices. Make sure that you're throwing your mascara away every, you know, if it's a big tube, they say every three months, the mascara that I recommend to patients, they throw it away every month because of that. So Some of this is ingredients, which we'll talk more about. Formaldehyde is a big one in mascara, but it's habits. And, you know, I could honestly, before I started doing all of this research, I could reach into my makeup bag and pull stuff out that had been there for, let's not even talk about months, but years that I would still use. So I know there's probably some people on our call tonight that probably need to go revisit their makeup bag and make some good decisions and toss some things that we haven't used. And another piece here is if you've ever had a patient come in with a corneal abrasion on based on, they were probably doing this in the car, which they won't tell you, oh, I just accidentally hit my eye. Yeah. You were driving in the car with your 20 ounce venti, whatever, um, and gouged yourself with your mascara wand. And typically it's pseudomonas. So just make sure you cover for that. When you see a patient on a triage that comes in with that. Another piece about mascara that patients should avoid is anything that says that it's going to extend their lashes. So if it has fiber lash in the name, that's a big no-no because these are typically nylon fibers and they can actually get embedded in the conge. They can cause more problems. So as we go through this, I'm just going to give you like the really easy things that you can implement tomorrow. And so this is another one just stay away from anything that says fiber in the title or in the name. And I actually did a little search just on Amazon of fiber lash mascara, and there's over a thousand different things that came up in that. So this is really common and an easy way to avoid, you know, patients having to go in and surgically have this removed. Um, And this is under a class action lawsuit for natural fibers. There's nothing natural about nylon. So those are things to look for as well. Um, You know, sunscreen is a big one. And when we talk about lids and lashes and showing them some love, one of the biggest things that we can offer to our patients is ophthalmic grade sunglasses because you can't put sunscreen on the inside of that eyelid. And that's the most common place on the body to get skin cancer is on our eyelids because you can't protect that with sunscreen. So one of the biggest pearls you can walk away with tonight is having that conversation with all of your patients. They need to wear sunglasses so that they best protect their eyes and they need to wear sunscreen. Um, But there's no way to protect, you know, and, and patients are always, curious and shocked when I say, by the way, did you know that the most common place in the body to get skin cancer is your eyelids? And they're like, what, what are you talking about? And I asked the question, when was the last time that you put sunscreen on your eyelids? And they're like, oh, I don't because it burns or it stings. I don't want to get it in my eyes. And they're like, oh, I see. So that's why that sunglass conversation is super important. Um, you know, because this is the, the culprit of that. And, you know, this was a patient, the older patient came in with like the tiniest, I'm not kidding. It was like the tip of a pencil lead and it just looked funny. And so we had it biopsied and this was how large the margins had to be to completely get that with his Mohs procedure. And then the other gentleman on the other side is not even 30 and his was actually squamous cell. So basal cell, squamous cell, and you can see exactly where his sunglasses actually hit and he doesn't wear sunscreen, he plays golf all the time. 
So just simple conversations that can really impact our patients and, and how they feel and what's happening for the longevity of their lives. So this is one of my favorite cases. Um, I had a patient that came in as a self-referral and she'd been struggling with dry eyes for close to 10 years. And she knew that I had IPL in my clinic and she's like, I just, I need more help. And I had, you know, kind of read her case history, of course, when I came in and looked at all of her numbers, but what struck me was as I was having the conversation with her and just getting to know her better is I could clearly tell she had been using a prostaglandin analog, something on her lashes. And so I asked her the question and, you know, you can spot that once you train yourself on looking for it on patients, you can spot it a mile away. And so I asked her, I was like, well, what kind of lash serum do you use? And she named off one of the ones that's over the counter. And I said, okay, well, here's the problem with that. And we walked through the fact that it's a prostaglandin analog. It's known to cause meibomian gland dysfunction. It's known to exacerbate cause dry eye disease. And she was super confused and really frustrated because one, I was the first person in 10 years to ask her that question. And two, she said, but you guys prescribe it for glaucoma all the time. I thought it was perfectly safe. It's perfectly safe for glaucoma. We use it for that, but there's side effects that patients don't know about. So those are the, some of the misconceptions that people have in the space. And that's why asking those questions are super important. I had another young lady who was 13 with her mom and I was just really suspicious the way her eyelashes looked. And I asked her the same question. I was like, do you put anything on your lashes to make them, you know, look really long and pretty? And she said, yeah, I got this stuff from my friend. And I asked her the name of it. And sure enough, it had a synthetic prostaglandin in it as well. And her mom didn't even know that she was using it. So this happens younger and younger. And it happens to lots of people because this is highly unregulated and the reason it's unregulated is because they're using a synthetic prostaglandin. And because it's a synthetic prostaglandin, it doesn't have to go through the FDA process. So you can put this out in the market and have no labels on it. And often they will say the active ingredient is aloe and you know things that sound really safe. But when you start digging into it and you look at the ingredient completely list, then you see isopropyl cloprostinate. That's your tip off that it's a synthetic prostaglandin. Um, and they will say the active ingredient is aloe and something else. So you have to actually look at the whole ingredient list. That's a, that's a big one that our patients are, again, unknowingly doing to themselves. So we have to ask that question of, you know, are your lashes natural? Or are you putting something on them to make them grow? Because we know that with anything prostaglandin related, we can cause ptosis and relative inophthalmos. Periorbital fat atrophy is a big one. Mybomian gland dysfunction, hyperpigmentation, you know, that redness that happens. I mean, they can change their eye color even. And then, you know, itching is a super common one. But that ingredient, isopropyl clopracinate, is so important and you'll see it. And if you do a, if you do a search, and, you know, just go on and look for lash serums, look at the active ingredient and then go and look for all of the ingredients. And you'll be surprised how many say, oh, it's all natural. And the culprit is isopropyl coprosinate. So blepharopigmentation is a big one too, that patients will unknowingly do to themselves on purpose because they either have dexterity issues or they just are tired of having, you know, maybe they have presbyopia and it's hard to see to put on their eyeliner, right? But unknowingly, when you put that tattoo needle through the meibomian glands, they've destroyed all of their meibomian glands. And honestly, some of my worst patients are the ones that have blepharopigmentation. So we have a conversation that there, because this has to be touched up about every three to five years, that we're not going to do that ever again. And of course, if you have patients that are educated enough to ask, should I do this? This is always an absolute hard no, um, because that permanent eyeliner can 
wreck those meibomian glands and that little tattoo needle you know comes right through and punches through i have a lot of people also ask me about microblading which is for people that don't know it's actually tattoo in the hairline of the brow so they're getting you know basically the image of a hair tattooed on their eyebrow and that also has to be redone and you can actually destroy the hair follicle there too so just be aware that that's also not a good idea. Um, and I tell my patients no on that one as well. Let's talk about terminology because this is something that further confuses the space. And we have to talk about that 1938 piece that goes back to this because no one is regulating this. And when you look at hypoallergenic, dermatologist recommended tested, fragrance-free, paraben-free, 187 products labeled with all of that out of those 89% contained at least one allergen and 117 products had two or more. So again, patients are paying for marketing and these are simply labels. And so we have to teach our patients to look deeper at the actual ingredient list. Um, and we have to start educating the public which is what I hope that our report through TFOS is going to do, that this is a problem and that we need to demand better. And when you look at the ingredient list in the US versus say the European Union, we only ban 11 ingredients in the US versus the European Union bans over 1300 different things. So it just goes back to that point that we can't believe what it says. We have to like do our homework. Um, here are some real common toxins in cosmetics. What does the published literature say? So we all know about BAK. We know that that's in a lot of the drops that you and I use because it's a common preservative. It's been around since 1940. And when you look at some of the things that people are using to take their makeup off, for example, like the, the makeup remover wipes, often it will have BAK, but it'll be about a thousand times the concentration of what we even use in a bottle. And so we know what that does to the ocular surface. And that's a really common mistake that we can make. So again, looking for ingredients, but do I like look at everybody's ingredient list and give them this? No, I hand them this list. Here's what I want you to look for so that we avoid these things. Um, that way they start to educate themselves. It's too much for us to be able to go through everybody's, you know, cosmetic kit and everything they're putting on their face, but we can certainly give them this ingredient list and we can build this as we go. Um, so let's keep going. Um, here's a common one that we all see, right? Uh, lash extensions. And I mean, even looking at this, you see lots of redness, hyperemia, just general unhappy eyelids. And there's a lot to this process. So these are anatomic, these are false lashes that are put on the anatomic lash and they're actually single lashes that are glued on. So when you have a patient look down, you can see the difference between the anatomic lash, the natural lash and where the false lash sits. There's a nice gap in that. And remember our lashes grow, you know, it takes about 150 days for our lashes to grow. It's a process. And so as those grow out, they have to constantly refill and redo these extensions about every two to four weeks. So you're taking off the old lashes and putting new ones on and they call it like filling or moving them up. And when you do that, you have to use glue solvents to dissolve the glue, to take them off. Lots of fragrances, all things that end up on the front surface. And then you're putting more glue back on. The problem with that is you, and you guys have all seen this, you see infe, you know, infection causing bacteria. You see tons of mite infestation with Demodex. You see debris. Um, you see some really unsavory things when you look between that anatomic lash and the, the fake lash. And so we have to teach patients how to take care of these. And that they're not a good idea, but you're going to have patients that aren't going to give these up. So I tell patients, make sure that you clean the lashes because often they'll be told not to clean them because it breaks the glue down. 
which is completely false. You can use hypochlorous acid to work on the bacteria. We don't have a good solution yet for Demodex, but we'll talk more about that here shortly. But there's things we can do to debulk it. And then go and take breaks between those fills, like leave them off for a couple of weeks before you put them back on and let things kind of reset because all kinds of complications, itching, redness, pain, you know, those eyelids can be really heavy. So you wind up with lag ophthalmos, you know, I'll be curious to see what happens in five, 10, 15 years, because you've got that heaviness. What's that doing to the, the tarsal plate? What's that doing to the orbicularis oculi? There's different things happening that we don't even know the unintended consequences yet. And then the glue adhesive, look for these formidable, falda, <laughs> that's a big word to say, formidable, formidable formaldehydes, um, English take two, but these are formaldehyde emitting products that wind up with formaldehyde gas on the front surface. And you'll see actually this in glues, and you'll also see these ingredients in mascaras too. So good four things to add to the list of what's already there, you know, and the mechanical consequences, again, of looking at this. And this is a great example. You see all of those telangiectetic vessels. You can clearly see Demodex between that natural lash and the, the fake lash and all of those spaces. And I often will use photography for this to help patients understand what's happening there. and that we've got to do better on how we clean these and why this is not a good idea long-term. But again, if they won't give them up, at least best practices. So why does all of this matter? It matters because when you think about the ocular surface and what's happening, there's multiple things. And we need to start with the lids and then work our way in. So the definition of dry eye disease, and there's multiple ones, but my favorite is Dave Kading's because it's it's really simple. Um, and he learned this from, from Donald Korb. So it's anything when the ocular surface structures fail to protect the ocular surface from desiccating stress. So what is desiccating stress? It can be cosmetic ingredients. It can be blepharitis. It can be all of these things that you see on the outside of that circle that can cause tear film instability. And then we wind up with mymomian gland dysfunction. We wind up with hyperosmolarity. Now you've got cell damage, apoptosis, and the corneal cells can't live in hyperosmolar states. So you're losing cells and eventually wind up with goblet cell loss and that vicious cycle that we're all aware of. But it's not just dry eye, it's lids. And it's the things that happen on the lids that can lead to dry eye and cause desiccating stress. So we really have to start on the outside and work our way in. And so we need a lid and lash strategy. And if we don't have one, we can make a simple one. Um, clean eyes are healthy eyes, you know, talking to our patients about that and making sure that they don't have blepharitis, talking to them about how to care for lash extensions, talking about how to prevent and best practices for mybomian gland dysfunction. We're all staring at devices and that blink reflex. We have to start having these conversations just as a wellness piece to all of our patients. What do we do for life to help our patients live their best lives? And these are part of those conversations. And then we can talk more about ocularization and Demodex but when you start to look at this list, you know, five years ago, I would diagnose someone with dry eye disease and it would be H16223, right? Or HO4123. But now we know more. Now we have patients that have dry eye disease. They have mybomian gland dysfunction. They have demodex blepharitis. They may have staph blepharitis. They may have styes and chalasia, ocularization. All of those things need to be coded in our charts. And the reason for that is because now we're going to have more targeted approaches so that we can address each and every one of those instead of the shotgun approach of, okay, I'm going to put one code in here and they actually have four different problems. So that's something that is a big takeaway for me is investing just a little bit of time in my EHR to properly diagnose patients so that I have targeted ways to treat each diagnosis. 
And this is a, a really common one. And we've talked about some pretty complicated things tonight, but this one is really simple. So if there's nothing else that you take away from tonight, this is the simple one. And you guys answered the poll question, have your patients look down, spend that one second looking at the base of lashes. You're going to uncover lots of things, Demodex and cholerets. You're going to uncover telangiectetic vessels. You're going to see lash extensions. Sometimes they're really good ones. And if they're right at the base, they're hard to see if you're having the patient look straight ahead. So there's such a missed opportunity to see what's really happening unless we have the patient look down. It's that simple, which I love simple when we're, especially when we're implementing new things, we need simple so that we can start there and then start to build these conversations. Um, and it's easily missed. I mean, when you have this patient looking straight ahead in that left picture, yeah, you can start to see that the lashes are a little misdirected and we've got some things like bent and maybe we're missing some lashes, but it's pretty hard to see anything else. You can't even see the base of the lash and you can't even see most of the eyelid. So that one act of having the patient look down and then I tease that skin up so that I can fully see what's happening. And look what I uncovered. Lots of telangiectetic vessels. I can clearly see cholerets. And I can more easily see that we've got lashes that are pointed to wrong directions. There's gaps in lashes. So those are all things that we can look at in that one second as the patient's looking down. And then I have an entrance questionnaire that all my patients fill out. And one of the questions is, you know, are you happy with the way that your lashes look? And I ask that question very specifically for multiple reasons. One, I want to know if they're putting serum on, but I also want to know if they're losing lashes and it just starts that conversation. And I can tie that back when I see it. I'm like, Hey, you know, have you noticed this? And they're like, yeah, I, it's frustrating that I can't see my lashes are like short and brittle. What's going on there. Um, so super simple, have the patient look down. You're going to uncover tons of things. So I want to talk about something that's really easy and demodex blepharitis identification is easy. Um, and this is a pervasive and damaging eye disease because this is inflammation of the eyelids causing irritation and redness. When I was in school 22 plus years ago or however many, um, we would actually, you know, pull a lash and look at the base and look for demodex. But what we now know is when you see a cholerette, it's pathognomonic for demodex. And that's why I said it's easy because when you see it, you know, you have it. And we're going to talk more about that. But again, I want to keep things simple. So 70% of blepharitis cases are due to demodex infestation. And that's a big thing that, that our patients don't always know, certainly. And they certainly, when you start talking about this, and we'll talk more about how to bring this up with patients. And I'll be curious how you guys talk about this. When we think about what's happening there, we have the mechanical part of that lash distension that you saw with my patient, where we've got, you know, things grow in the wrong direction. And we see the mites attached to the follicles. We see all of that deposit and debris. The bacterial things that happen because they've got bacteria that live on them, it may elicit some kind of immune response. And then you alter mybum concentration because of the chemical part of what's happening with demodex mites. And so this all feeds into what's happening with the eyelids and the mybomian glands. And then we led to dry eye disease. And so that's why we have to start on the outside and then work our way in. Because these clinical manifestations of demodex and those disorders of the eyelashes can lead to all kinds of things that our patients just don't know. Um, and if they're unhappy with the way their eyelashes look and they're doing things to make their eyelashes look better, then we've got to have this conversation about the things they're doing. Just as simple as we've got to like take good care of our lids so that you have lashes. It's just like our hair. I mean, you put conditioner on your hair. We need to take good care of our lashes because the better you take care of your lashes, the longer and thicker they're going to be because they'll be healthier. Not to mention that we're, you know, can cause mybomian gland dysfunction, you know, lid margin inflammation when patients are utilizing over the counter redness reducing drops. Is it because their lids are red or because the conge is red? And most of our patients aren't discerning enough to look at the difference. They just know their eyes are red. 
And then you have people that are on lash serums and their lid margins are red and they don't even look at that. They're just so focused on the lashes. And then of course we can get corneal manifestations and, you know, marginal infiltrates. You know, we've all seen those flectinial life lesions, things that cause corneal problems then that can threaten vision. So this is not a benign condition. This is something that we have an obligation to look for, diagnose. You know, our challenge historically has been that we don't have great treatments for Demodex, but that is hopefully going to change here shortly. But I went back to, you know, cholera or pathognomonic for Demodex bufferitis. And again, if you see this on patients and that simple act of looking down, 100% of patients with cholera have Demodex. That's why this is easy. Um, we can see that patient has Demodex bufferitis. We code it in our chart B88.8 and put in our, our assessment and our plan with that particular diagnosis alongside if we have my mummy and gland dysfunction, dry eye disease, et cetera. So it is prevalent, very prevalent in our eye care clinics. And when they looked at the Titan study, this was looked at over six different centers, OD, MD centers across the U.S., and they were looking at cholerates for diagnosis. And what was interesting is 58% with Demodex blepharitis, also 58% had dry eye diagnosis. What I have found clinically when I look for cholerates on every single patient now, which is different than before I had this data, I in my clinics, it's actually higher. Um, and you'll see it across all age groups from teenagers, you know, all the way up to, you know, people in their the centurions um, will have this. And so it's actually really common. That's the point here. And when you start looking for it, you're going to, you're going to see it all the time. Um, and we don't have to, again, pluck lashes. If we see cholerets, we know it's Demodex blepharitis and patients will have comorbidities with this. When you look at, I mean, how many prescriptions do we write for contact lens wearers? And patients are frustrated when they fall out of wearing contact lenses. And when you look at patients that have Demodex blepharitis, 90% of those are intolerant to their contact lenses. So that's a big one that you and I do and look at every day and prescribe contact lenses every day. Patients that are going in for cataract surgery, over half will have Demodex um, infestation. So we really need to clean those lids, make sure the ocular surface is optimized before we send them to the surgeon. All of that can be done in our clinics before we get over there and they have to pause or even worse, move forward with the surgery and they, the patient doesn't have the best outcome possible because the lids and the, the ocular surface weren't treated properly. When you look at patients that are on some sort of dry eye prescription, over 60% um, also have Demodex. So, those patients that aren't getting the therapeutic levels that you want them to get to, or still have symptoms of itching or, you know, other things going along with it. Itching is a big one. Um, and remember when they, when they itch, what is the question that you should ask your patient when they say my eyes itch, make them show you where it itches. Is it itch in the corner or are you itching? Like just have them show you where it itches because they'll do that. They're like, you know, it itches like right here. You can see them actually doing that. That's, you don't even have to go further from that because you know, right then that's Demodex. Um, if they're itching in the corner, that's usually allergic conjunctivitis and they'll have papillae and other things going on with it, but just things to tie together. And then 65% of patients um, and glaucoma patients, right? We know that they have ocular surface issues a lot of times because of the medications they're on. Demodex becomes part of that because now we have treatment intolerance because of how the ocular surface feels. And you'll see patients actually stop using their medication because their ocular surface is in so much trouble. They don't want to put anything in. And so now the very medication that we're trying to save our patient's vision with, they're not even use, utilizing in a compliant way. And then facial rosacea, 60% of patients that have um, rosacea sometimes will also have Demodex. These kind of almost go hand in hand. And because I do so much intense pulse light and I have a lot of patients with rosacea. And when you start looking for those telangiectetic vessels, you'll notice how many of your patients have rosacea as well. 
these patients often have demodex blepharitis. And so it's one of the most common things you're going to see clinically and one of the most simple to diagnose. And the negative part of this for our patients, remember the title of this is show your lids and lashes some love. People are doing things to make sure that they look the best possible. And when they have itchy eyes, dry eyes, foreign body sensation, watery eyes, all of those things impact our patients. And over half have had symptoms for over four years and close to 60% have never been diagnosed. So there's a big opportunity here to properly assess our patients and properly diagnose our patients so that we can get them the help that they want because this, uh, this affects their functionality with constantly either worrying about their eyes or eyelids, negative appearance of how they look. I think the biggest one for me is patients feeling their eyes or just conscious of their eyes all day long. Imagine what that does to your psyche when you're constantly aware of something. I mean, it's like an itchy tag in a new shirt or a new jacket. And you're constantly aware of that all day long. Imagine what that does to your psyche if that's how your eyes feel. Difficulty driving at night. I think that's an interesting one. Um, and I need more research and digging in further on why that is. And then additional time needed for daily hygiene. Difficulty taking you know, makeup off. All of those things negatively impact how our patients feel about themselves and about their quality of life. So we have some exciting news because historically we have struggled to manage our patients with demodex blepharitis because we have no FDA approved therapeutic for demodex blepharitis. We have TPO3 that is in development and their PDUFA date is September 27th. So this is Laudaliner Ophthalmic Solution 0.25%. And when you look at the study data around this, this is a drop that patients will be able to use twice a day for six weeks. And it directly paralyzes the mite nervous system. So they no longer live. And we're looking for mite eradication. And let's look at the data around Saturn 1 and Saturn 2, which were their pivotal trials around TPO3. And this is why it's so important for us to properly diagnose patients and why it's so important to code this in your chart, B88.8, so that you can mine your data. If you've never diagnosed a patient and if you've never coded it, it's really hard to go back and search for those patients because you have nothing to search for. So that's why it's important to diagnose and use, use codes that go along with this. So we're looking for a consistent cure and response in these two pivotal trials. And this was two large trials over 800 patients. The primary and secondary endpoints were cholerate cure, mite eradication, and lid erythema. And they met all of those with high st statistical significance. And you see clinical and statistically significant effects as early as two weeks. Um, patients, again, were asked to be on this twice a day for six weeks. And we had a very high responder rate to TPO3. 96% of patients improved at least one cholerate grade and 89% achieved a clin clinically meaningful cure. So let's talk about cholerate scale and the grading system. And what I don't want you to do is go back to clinic tomorrow and go, okay, is this a grade four or a grade three or a grade two? I just want you to look at the lids and look for cholerates. The grading scale is super helpful for us to know, okay, my patient is at a grade four and I have a 96% chance that they're at least going to go down a grade and actually 80 plus percent that we're going to go to a grade zero or a grade one. Um, that's the takeaway here. I don't want to overcomplicate this, but this is the Colorette scale that was used and the average patient baseline in Saturn one and Saturn two was a grade three patient. So that means between one third and two third of their lashes on the lid had collarettes. So they had approximately a hundred collarettes per lid. Um, so very significant collarettes is the point to that. And when we see that getting to grade zero, which is what the FDA's primary endpoint was, was complete cure of collarettes. That's important for us when we look at the data. Lid erythema is something that we normally don't look at on a scale. And I think this is really important. So this is the scale that they use in Saturn one and Saturn two, severe, moderate, mild, none. 
And we need to be looking for those telangiectetic vessels so that we can properly assess lid erythema in addition to conjunctival um, hyperemia. So this is what sometimes patients get confused by. My eyes are red. Okay, well, is it your lids that are red or the eye and the bulbar conj is red? What's actually red, right? Patients will just say, my eyes are red. They'll reach for something over the counter that's redness reducing, and they'll utilize something that you and I typically don't want them utilizing. So the, when they say my eyes are red, that's when we need to dig a little bit deeper. But patients will often, again, try to self-treat with something that has nothing to do with what's actually red. When you look at Saturn 1 and Saturn 2, the baseline characteristics, again, number of patients, we had over 833 patients. The average age was 65, um, more female in Saturn 1. Saturn 2 is pretty evenly balanced. And then that Colorette score again was grade three, mites per lash three, and that erythema score was going to be mild to moderate. So two successful pivotal trials with consistency across the endpoints. So primary endpoint was complete Colorette cure, so grade zero. So the grade threes had to go all the way to zero um, when you look at that. And over half versus 10%. And then clinically meaningful cholera reduction to 10 or less was 85%, massive. And then secondary endpoint was my eradication, lid erythema, and then we'll talk about safety. But 85% of the patients achieved that clinically meaningful cholera cure by week six. But we saw in the clinical trials that patients were statistically significant actually at week two. So when you look at these patients, Average baseline day zero, cholera at grade three, post-treatment day 43. So at the end of that six weeks, cholera at grade zero. And then second patient, cholera at grade three again to grade zero. So it's more about knowing what's abnormal and then knowing what's normal versus, you know, going back to clinic tomorrow and going, okay, I'm going to grade this as a three or a two or a one. Um, I just want us to get really good at identifying cholera and this patient has this, have the patient look down, and then now hopefully we're going to have an answer for this in a few short months, considering it's like mid-July already. I'm like, what is happening? How did this happen? It's July 6th. So my eradication um, with TPO3 and Dimbinex blepharitis patients, and again, we're looking at complete eradication on 60% of patients from grade three. So I do all kinds of things in my clinic. You know, I do blepharo exfoliation. We do IPL. And this continues to be a problem because we don't have a therapeutic drop to treat demodex blepharitis. Um, and so this is really exciting when we've got a, a possibility of having a medication to help us with these patients that have clinic clinically meaningful issues with demodex blepharitis and the fact that it is so common. And then when you look at the lid erythema cure and, you know, having patients go from day zero erythema grade one to erythema grade zero, um, and 25% of patients saw a reduction in that. So that's just in the first six weeks. I'll be curious as we start to utilize this, hopefully in clinic, you know, what that looks like long-term. Um, we saw that in a, sh a, short, a short amount of time in that six-week period. So ocular adverse event summary. Um, overall, there were low rates of ocular adverse events across both studies, Saturn 1 and Saturn 2. So installation site pain, burning steam were the most common. And then very mild installation site puritis, visual acuity reduced, eye pain discharge, zero in dry eye. So all of those were mild or moderate. And then there's the drop comfort summary. You know, over 90% of the patients said this is very neutral. Um, high drop comfort level was experienced by patients. You know, the last thing we want to be able to do is prescribe something the patient's going to struggle to use. And we didn't see that in the clinical trials. So just some key takeaways around Demodex. And then I'm going to wrap it up with great questions to ask your patients in the clinic. This is very common. Um, Demodex mites may be present in about 70% of all our blepharitis cases. It's often misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed. One of the reasons for that is historically, we haven't had a good way to treat it. 
why would we bring something up if we don't have a good way to treat it? And so we weren't looking for it, but now we know differently. We have the patients look down. We take that 1000, you know, that one second and we look for it. Um, it's prevalent all across our patient populations, whether they're getting ready for cataract surgery, they've got dry eye, our contact lens patients, you know, teenagers, patients certainly that have chronic chalazia, hordeola. That's a big one that patients really struggle with psychosocially and a clinical burden. Um, you know, because unless you have IPL, those patients are doing a steroid injection, you know, they may have to do something surgical. So a huge burden in that specific patient population. And if we can eradicate that root cause, then just addressing the superficial symptoms, that's what we've historically had to do because we didn't have any other options. So um, start to look for that, take that one second, have the patient look down, super easy. Code it correctly in your chart so that you can identify these patients and go back and look for these patients. Um, Here's some great questions to ask. And you notice that I do this with the patients that I've talked about case studies. Ask, man, your lashes are really long. Is that natural? Are you putting something on them to make them grow? That will elicit so many things that you'll be astounded. Just that one question, what you can uncover. Walk me through how you clean your lash extensions. Do you take breaks between the fills? Um, how do you take your makeup off? Do you sleep in your makeup? Those are habits that people have, especially teenagers, college kids. Don't sleep in your makeup. That's an easy one. Um, do your eyelids bother you? You know, that's a whole different lecture, but that eyelid question is huge. Do you want your eyes to be more open? The delicate area around the eye, common place for skin cancer. What kind of sunglasses are you wearing? Those are all questions that you can sprinkle either through how you ask questions with the intake form, whether that's your technician doing that, whether you're following up with that, that your patient or your um, technician, you know, lobs you, and then you can knock it out of the park when they start that conversation for you. This is one of those slides I wish I had made years ago, and I'll, I'll keep building on it because we've talked a lot about what not to do. So what are we supposed to do in place of that? And we know not to use a prostaglandin analog, but you can look for things that have polypeptides and lipopeptide lash conditioners. Waterproof mascara, that's a big no. Always non-waterproof. Um, those are easy ones because it's so hard to get that off of the lashes. That's why that's never a good idea. Glittery eyeshadows contain little tiny chunks of painted glitter or mica, which is a ground up stone, both of which are not healthy for the mammomian glands. And if you can stick to something that's got shimmer or a matte eyeshadow, that's a pencil, not a powder, those are things that they can do. Retinol is always an absolute no for dry eye patients. Um, I will allow patients to use retinol always with sunscreen, two finger widths away from the myobian glands. If they're a dry eye patient, it's always a no, because we know that that can destroy myobian glands. So, you know, you can replace it with caffeine, vitamin C, CE ferulic is a big one. Um, anything with HA, niacinamide, there's good studies behind all of those ingredients to help skin. False lash strips with latex and formaldehyde. Look for individual false lashes with non-formaldehyde non and latex lash glue. Extensions we talked about, you know, best not to use them, but if they won't give them up, at least talk about how to clean them, take breaks in between, look at the ingredients on the lash glue, look at the glue solvents. Um, don't use oil-based eye makeup removers. The reason you don't want to use waterproof mascara is because you have to use an oil-based water makeup remover to get it off. Um, micellar water, you just have to look for the ingredients because sometimes they'll sneak things in there. And then eyeliner on the waterline, how we opened up the program was with someone putting eyeliner directly on the waterline, right on top of the mammalian glands. Um, eyeliner stays on the dry side, just watch the ingredient list. So good resources so that you can start to do more of this homework yourselves or if patients are curious. Um, there's our publication on TFOS lifestyle, the impact of cosmetics on the ocular surface. That is a great resource. There's still lots of work that we need to do and more research to be done, but that will get you started. 
The EWG app is a really good one that patients can actually just use their camera to scan a QR code and it will flag for them. Um, and then, you know, look at the lids.com has a ton of great information around Demodex blepharitis and looking your patients right in the eyelids. And you can see that this is a patient that clearly has Demodex blepharitis based on the colorettes that you already see right there. So having your patients look down, um, super key.